there's two kind of easy, if you want to call it that way, the two most successful ways to do it are to increase your availability or to increase your procedure mix. Hey, ambitious dentist, welcome to Start Your Dental Practice, the show for existing and aspiring dentists to take your dental practice to the highest possible level. I'm your host, Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV, founder of DentistMetrics.com. Every episode, we aim to demystify the how to start a dental practice problem by bringing on world-class dentists, influencers, and consultants in the dental industry to pick their brain about how to get past the barriers involved from going from no practice to being a practice owner to owning your own successful dental practice. Hello, ambitious dentist. So today I have a catch-up phone call with one of my favorite guests from Start Your Dental Practice. He's one of my favorites because uh, he's an Arkansas guy, just like myself. Uh, everybody in Arkansas likes other people from Arkansas. So I'm fin- I'm really excited to have back on the call on the podcast with us, uh, Dr. Hunter Smith. If if you don't recall, uh, Dr. Hunter Smith is a uh, a legend on Dental Town as well as in a lot of dental circles because. Dr. Hunter, he went out of dental school and I'll venture to say was a bit crazy uh, and bought a bunch of dental practices right out of school. Uh, some people would say that's crazy. Some people would say it's genius. Um, where the truth may lay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have Dr. Hunter be able to give us some perspective on that. And reposted the episode on Facebook of, of his interview with us, which is a really great one. It chronicles his story from being from getting out of dental school to being a multi, multiple practice owner. Uh, and I believe it was, he went from like zero to five in like two years or something like that. It, it's a fantastic episode. And Dr. Hunter was like, hey, uh, there's a lot of updates. And I knew there had been updates. I know, and, and he's been gracious enough to be able to come back on the podcast with us. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hunter Smith, the uh, CEO and co-owner of GPS Dental uh, here in Arkansas. So uh, Dr. Hunter, thanks so much for coming back on. Yeah, man. Thanks, JV. It's been a uh, been a couple of years now, or maybe a year. I can't time it goes fast and slow at the same time. So I don't know how long it's been since we jumped on one of these. But obviously, we've stayed in touch outside of this. But yeah. it's uh, you know, to answer your question, it's both crazy and and genius. At a lot of times, I have good days and bad days where I wonder what the heck we're doing, and then other days I think we know everything. So it's it's a it's a crazy profession and crazy ride for us for sure. I'm sure we could go find some motivational quote that says uh, genius is masked by craziness, or some people think that genius is just another word for crazy. So we've also introduced some some people into the world since then. I know you've got a, a young son too, uh, and it has been a while for us to be able to, to connect. So so share with us what has happened between the last time we spoke and today with. Uh, GPS Dental. You were at five practices then. Tell us what's happened. What, what all's gone on in the in your world? Yeah, so if it was five, then it must have been sometime just before you know August of sixteen when we actually recorded the call. We bought practice number six in August of two thousand sixteen, and that was kind of for us. That was kind of the breaking point. It was it was our first one that was outside of I guess easy driving distance for us, um, and it really was. We were already at a tipping point in terms of our personal time that we could spend both doing dentistry and being in uh, in multiple practice ownership. So we made that decision with the sixth one to really what I consider become a company and and a business. And we brought on some people at the administrative level. We stepped out of dentistry almost completely. Well, I did. And and Dr. Little, Will, my partner, has been uh, trying to get there as well. He's real close now. Um, So that sixth practice kind of when we made a decision to, to change our practice or our career trajectories a little bit. And since then, uh, we've added locations up to just closing on location 12 and being under LOI on, on practice number 13, which will close at the beginning of the year, uh, January 2nd. So uh, we've built out a, a full administrative team with on-site human resources and marketing and operations and insurance credentialing and accounting. And uh, we got a call center that's opening up at the end of the year. So uh, we're as, we've structured legally to be you know quote unquote a dso and i think in this call we can kind of talk about what that term means because i I do think there is some probably misconception about corporate dentistry and and dso's and what those different what the terminology differences are um so we've kind of taken that step to doing that we 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 currently support 12 offices 19 doctors and and 99 employees so we got to hire even 100 
You're gonna get you're gonna get to have a big celebration for number one hundred. <laughs> if we have any money left after, <laughs> I don't know. but yeah, that's the question, right? That that's a great place to start because I, I have so many people that'll talk to me and they'll be like, I've got one practice and I want to start a DSO. Um, how do I go about doing that? To me, whenever they start saying those types of things, I'm like, you don't really know what that is, do you? Um, so why don't you define for us what a DSO is and from the owner of a DSO, what does that what does that mean to you? Yeah, so they're, they're, it's kind of used interchangeably with corporate dentistry or, or, or something like that. And uh, even to an extent, group practices at this point. But a, a DSO is dental service organization or dental support organization. They've, they've kind of gone back and forth on, on that terminology. But it's basically an entity that provides management level support, administrative support to a clinical entity. So, yeah, you could you could theoretically separate your dental practice into a DSO and a clinical side and, and every business owner, every dentist that's a business owner kind of knows that there's two hats that we wear in that in that regard. Um, but a DSO that supports in multiple practices in that way pulls that hat off the dentist's head and and supports them with things like, you know, what I talked about that we centralized, human resources, marketing, operations and insurance, billing and accounting, and provides those services to clinical staff members and, 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 and a lot of times doctors. Now, the reason it's used interchangeably with, with corporate dentistry, in my opinion, is because another benefit, quote unquote, to depending on who you are, the DSO structure is that a non-dentist can be an equity shareholder or have ownership in the DSO LLC, the DSO component of uh, of the dental practice, if you will. So that's where, you know, yeah, the bigger corporations are set up as DSOs, but completely doctor-owned organizations like, like Will and I and our group is also a DSO. And even within that, there's just a wide, wide variation in what support services they offer, whether they're Backed privately or publicly, whether they're, you know, there's just a lot of, it's a term that's used too widely, I guess is what I'm trying to get at, to describe too many different things. Um, and there's pros and cons to each of those, and then all the cons kind of get thrown at the at the DSO terminology. So uh, that's kind of a, just a tirade on it. But yeah, we are, we're organized in that way because we do separate our clinical and our management because we think it provides the best support to to our doctors and uh, allows us to be more efficient at the at the administrative level. Okay, and so as far as you know, you, you mentioned at the sixth practice, whatever it was, you know, geographically separate from the cluster of the other practices, was whenever you decided that this is the time for us to kind of turn into this DSO organization. What would you have defined yourself prior to that sixth practice? You know, I think we were we were just barely more sophisticated than a dentist that had a bunch of different satellite offices uh, at that point. And we were we were within a kind of a defined a geographical area. Um, the the offices looked very very different uh, in terms of even things like their practice management software, even things like their their the way that they confirm and the way that they bill and the way that their their accounting is is managed. You know, I was. Myself and Will were the ones doing that thing, so it had shared, I guess, administrators or managers. But in terms of kind of a conglomerate, uh, we were we were not much different than a, a, hand, a, a cluster of uh, individually owned practices. So when we when we bought that sixth one, you know, it was getting where we, where we couldn't be there that day. We couldn't uh, learn a new practice management software or. or or handle all the insurance credentialing ourselves, and and because it was you know had it was one that had a lot of different insurances that we were in network with, so it was really a a time for us to step back and decide, okay, what are we doing this for? If if our goal is to, I think we talked about this in one of our calls, is is our goal to be multiple practice owners in the sense that we have three to five individual locations and we do the specialty level work for them, and we're basically now pseudo specialist or really defined clinicians within a, a certain procedural range, or are we going on and we're going to become uh, administrative support for a lot of different offices? And if we choose that, realize that we're undertaking kind of a lot of work and, and making these things look more similar from an administrative standpoint. Uh, and we decided to go that direction for, for a variety of reasons. If you had to sum up into, you know, a few of the top reasons what would be the the biggest reasons for going down the, the the route that you've gone? 
I think you know, from a personal standpoint, uh, I don't enjoy the clinical aspect of dentistry, the, the hands-on part, just from a, um, you know, a day-to-day grind standpoint. I think a lot of dentists don't, but for me, I kind of carried it too much. Um, the whole thing with becoming a dentist is you were supposed to be able to, you know, it wasn't like being a, a real doctor, quote unquote, you know, it's, you're not supposed to take that stuff home and think about it. And, and me and, and my issues mentally, you know, I would, I, if I had a, a difficult extraction case or a different, difficult crown prep or the crown didn't fit exactly how I wanted it to, I would think about it too much and I, I would kind of carry that. And just a little too stressful for me, which maybe I was being a baby about it, but I had an alternative path and I thought that would be more fit me personally. And then from a professional standpoint, we felt like we were doing a, a good thing. We were allowing doctors to, to join up with us and, and retire on their own terms and we could support them in that way and we could bring in young dentists at a, at a better clip to help them transition out and help these young dentists by getting them in new practices and having the opportunity for ownership, having clinical mentors on, you know, as part of our team to help them transition into real world dentistry. So we thought we were doing, we thought we had a little niche there in our market to, to be able to support that. And we started getting hit up by individual practice owners that wanted to join our group. So it wasn't like we were seeking some of these opportunities and it kind of snowballed from there, I guess. Gotcha. As far as, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that about the, um, the stress from the clinical side of the things, you know, I, I speak to practice owners every day that that's not the stressful part to them. The stressful part to them is the business side. Instead of you worrying about those things, you would decide to exponentially expand the business issues that those doctors, uh, uh, stress, that stress those, those people out. Um, so that's, that's pretty interesting trade-off that you're able to offer, doctors like and I'm sure that's the reason that you had so many people you know contacting you about joining the group is because they got tired of that stuff full disclosure here uh Dr. Hunter and I have texted at like 11:30 at night on Friday nights about business things before um uh, so uh, and we were both working at the time I, I assume that's because you enjoy those types of things comparatively to the clinical side of things if, if I can make that assumption yeah I think so uh, I mean uh, obviously like it more than clinical dentistry for me and my stress levels. And I'm not going to say it's not stressful, the things that we do. I mean, it's, it, it requires a little bit of risk. It requires planning. It requires hours and travel and things like that. But uh, for me, that's better than the clinical trade-offs that I was making. And, you know, a lot of, uh, you speak about, you know, individual practice owners and they, they hate the stress of running a business. And One, it's because we're not taught. And two, it's because it's, you know, kind of, there's a lot of bad information out there. And yeah. I think everybody would say the number one stressor is in terms of a, of a business standpoint, I guess, and the practice level is the staff and the human resources is, or, uh, issues that come up. And I can tell you as, you know, the practices that we've practiced in before, that's way more of an issue. You know, you establish relationships with your staff, you, you know, their stories, you know, their, uh, their needs and wants and desires, and you, and you know, their, what's happening at home and that's harder to to then run a business knowing all that Um, whereas when you're a little bit removed from that and you can kind of i guess kind of a a gross way of saying it is judge that individual based on just their work performance and just how they're uh, how they're doing you know with their job responsibilities it's a little bit easier to to confront them about those things and say why is this happening no you'll learn their stories as you as you address the issues, but being that little bit removed takes a little bit of that stress off that you carry when you, when you start to develop really strong relationships with your staff members that you see literally every day. So uh, we feel that in our offices that we've worked at, it's, I mean, uh, it's a lot harder for me to communicate as a, as a leader with the people that I became a dentist with when I was a young dentist. Um, a lot, of, a lot of easier when I'm communicating with someone who knows what my role in the company is. So, sure. So you're saying that by you being the CEO of multiple offices, it's easier for you to have a conversation with a hygienist about you're you're not offering the treatment plan philosophy that our practice has as a company. Whereas if a dentist was to be having that conversation, that was just a single practice owner that would be a harder conversation because they can't blame the person upstairs. Is that that kind of how you're saying that? Exactly. Or even, I mean, we try to stay out of the 
the, the production game for obvious reasons about you know the negative connotations there. But for uh, I mean, example that we lost tardiness or you know, especially coming back from lunch or getting there in the morning, um, that's harder when you know when you may get there after them and you don't see that until clock in or clock out day then you got to go address it like, well you got here right to be you know it, it's fine doc i mean i was still set up ready to go in there but you know you're okay yeah you're probably right it's not a big deal it's not affecting my day to day but it may be negatively affecting your other staff members who do get there on time uh who do hold that as a, as a responsibility to be prepared to be courteous of other people's time whereas me being moved from the practice or you know, in this case, more particularly our human resources uh, executive VP, she's looking at timesheets. She's seeing someone's consistently late, and she's able to then go to that person and say, "Look, this is a problem because you know you're putting stress on your staff, your your coworkers, mm-hmm. and that's a lot harder for their coworkers to say when they got to go see her the next day, or the doctor to say when they got to go see her the next day. So it's just it's just that ease of being just one step removed allows those business type things to be a little less stressful." Yeah, and that, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, one, one of the, I'm sure you see it a lot as well. One of the issues that occurs with a lot of young practice owners uh, is that they don't know how to lead those conversations, and they, you know, sometimes just saying, "Well, that's the rule," isn't you know enough of that. And like you mentioned, sometimes it can make a lot of sense. You know, the hygienist comes in late or whoever comes in late, and it doesn't affect you specifically, but it affects other team members. And also, like, you know, what habit are you encouraging over time? Maybe a minute or two late today, maybe, you know, nothing happens and then time goes on and it just keeps getting worse and worse. So, yeah, I like that example. So, um, as far as the the running of the practice, seeing the difference you have today versus whenever you had the five or six practices, what would if you had to talk to that person today, what would be the number one piece of advice you would give to that to yourself, you know, two years ago? It gets a little bit easier as you expand, but you know, we were really we lived and breathed day to day of the all the practice. So if if one practice had a bad day, I mean we really we felt it. And one or two practices kind of carried months. So if they had bad months, we would as a business suffer because of that. So, you know, for if I was given a piece of advice to myself three years ago or two years ago, I mean, I would say, you know, take a deep breath, step back, and look at the business's health as a, as a, you know, with a, I guess, a, a higher viewpoint. Um, can you withstand one or two months of this? And, and what happened to cause that month? Instead of just freaking out and, and looking to change everything, and your supply bill is high one month, then put a strict budget on the on the supplies for the next month. It was more of a, you know, we just really cared a lot about every single day and it, it allowed us to not take a big picture view until we expanded enough that we were more secure with our position. So we, I feel like we've either been lucky or good, one of the two, about when to add things and when, in terms of personnel and when to change certain things um, in terms of practice management software and centralize different tasks. But we definitely had a too close of an eye on, I think, to micromanage early in our journey into mobile practice. Do you feel like that can be an, an issue with even single practice owners? Because we send out a report every month to our clients that says, you know, this is how profitable you are. This is how well you spent your money, you know, overhead percentages. And that's plotted against rules of thumb industry standards. And we have some clients that just bugs crap out of. They don't like it whenever they get above those percentages and they can't get past why that is. And even if it's the sum of all percentages. Yeah, I think so. What serves as you find uh, as giving them that information uh, allows them to make actionable changes. So that's certainly, I mean, that's a huge win for individual practice. But what I feel like where the mistake is, is not understanding, and I think someone like yourself who can consult on that can help them understand why, you know, when to make those actual changes and why the numbers are showing what they do. I mean, if they're a young practice, they're going to have a higher advertising. If they're a, if they have an Otero or some kind of bill or something, and they're coding their block and uh, supplies for the scanner under a supply feed, then they're going to have a higher supply cost than the average, quote unquote, and they're lab percentage would be smaller. So understanding what those numbers are telling you, even though it, even if it's outside of what's the right-hand column comparable, is is important and not making visions that go against what your practice philosophy and your practice and your practice's style is because of that is really important. I think the most 
common example I see is dentists freaking out about their supply costs. They're just mm-hmm. really bothered. It's, you know, if someone tells it's supposed to be five, and there's a six, they're going to stare and watch every single, you know, glove and anesthetic cartridge. And God forbid they get a good bonding agent, but they won't they won't take the time to run a report that says, okay, we had 25 hygiene patients today, and 20 of them walked out the door without an appointment. I mean, they don't realize that that's that's the big picture. That's you know it's why you're needing that bonding agent because these hygiene patients that are coming back for restorative work, and you're not even concerned that they don't have the next follow up appointment. And unless they call us or we get to that unscheduled treatment list one day, they're not going to get a call. So they don't understand. Uh, that's not a good way to put it. Not understanding, but they sometimes care too much about the wrong. They micromanage the wrong components of their business because it's easy to understand. They look at it and they say, okay, look, six percent is more than five. That's bad, and, and never really understand where that number comes from. Like you said, you know that, that percentage is a is, is a fraction of revenue, right? And so, if they don't understand what's happening with revenue, then a lot of the times that could be the issue of why that number is higher than it should be, because they they'll they'll micromanage that expense so much to be able to get that to a low percentage, but they might be doing that at the cost of revenue. I mean, a very common example is that you know we'll have people reach out and say, um, you know, should I, should I? And this is the easiest one. To, uh, to to explain, but should I stop doing something like, you know, Invisalign because it's got, you know, a, a $1,500 to $1,800 lab fee that goes along with it and I charge, you know, four or $5,000. And that's, you know, that's like 30, you know, 30 to 40% lab fees for that one service. And people say that labs should be, you know, say 7%. So that number is really high. So should I stop offering this service? Um, and they don't understand that, you know, while you could stop doing that and your lab percentage may somewhat go down, your revenue, your total absolute value of your re- of your profit is going to be hurt from that. The example I give to people is if I could give you a billion dollars and it cost you nine hundred ninety million, you know, you'd still end up with ten million dollars. Would you do that? And the answer is yes. Um, so even though it's ninety nine percent overhead. Right. Um, that's an, yep. that's an extreme example of it, but that, you know, you have to weigh in, you know, your, your, your time costs and things like that as well. But that, that's a very common misconception because they don't get revenue. So on that note, being a, a, an owner of multiple locations, what part of the dentist is, so, and this is something that I've, I've not been able to, my, my finger exactly on it in, in my career in dentistry, but it, it's very apparent that successful, pra- you know, quote, successful, unquote, practices, they have really great productive dentists in them. And what do you, as a, as a practice, you know, multiple practice location owner, what do you guys do to be able to help someone who might be struggling with that get to a better spot with that? Um, and the example I'm saying is that the, the easiest way to illustrate this is, you have a practice that is an older practice that's doing five to $700,000 a year in revenue. New dentist comes in, all of a sudden it's doing a million dollars a year in revenue because that new dentist is hungry. They're being, maybe they're more comprehensive in their treatment planning. Maybe they offer more services. Maybe they're better at ex- communicating to the patients and things like that. that that's an example of, of what I'm talking about there. And that, I, I see that constantly in practices that are having issues with this expense issue is because you know that 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 provider isn't producing enough um what do you guys do as far as to be able to help people with that process or do you do you agree with that um statement do you disagree with it you know, talk to me through it yeah i do agree with that i think the you know the, the best way to lower your overhead is to increase your production and collections i mean that's it's got a, a really strong return in that way, uh, especially against your, your fixed expenses. Obviously, they're not going to move. I'll say with a caveat, first of all, that it's very hard. And I, I kind of harp on this when buying practices is you should you should assume that the practice that you're buying is going to do exactly what it's doing now because it, it may have limitations that are even outside of your control. But it's hard to grow a dental practice. I mean, uh, there's two kind of easy, if you want to call it that way, and the two most successful ways to do it are to increase your availability or to increase your procedure mix. If those if increase your procedure mix to the extent that it doesn't negatively affect your other your more your highly profitable procedures in your time, if that makes sense. You don't you don't want to be adding 
long procedures that when you're already at capacity in your in your current workload. So availability and procedure mix are, are the two things that you first got to judge when you're when you're saying, okay, I want to grow this practice. How do I make it more? How do I make it more uh, increase the revenue? So if you're if you're working four days a week, I mean, the easiest way would be to add this day. And now it's a lot of people will disagree with that without thinking it through. And I even got docs who work for me that I can't really convince this of. But just because you're not busy all hours of a four day work week does not mean that the fifth day is not going to be profitable. The easiest way I can think to illustrate this is maybe not having waiting too long to add the additional hygienist. Um, you know, if you have one column of hygiene, they see eight patients a day. And half of them no-show, or I just make it easy and say if there's eight of them, that a fourth of them no-show. So you lose two patients, and now you see six. If you add two columns um, of six patients, you know, then it's you have more wiggle room for that, for the no-shows that happen, the cancellations, the the changes that happen on a schedule to negatively affect you, even though you have two people who are not necessarily at full capacity at that point. So it's the same thing with a dentist and their schedule. If they're if they're four days a week available, then they're going to get a certain amount of work. But if they make that fifth day available, uh, if they make that till seven o'clock appointments available, even though they may not have something at four, um, they're increasing the ability for a patient to schedule with them. They're they're knocking down a barrier to entry, which is availability, um, and and that's getting increasingly more demanded dental patients i mean they more and more they're wanting because they they have the option to go places that that have more convenient hours for them and i guess without keeping on harping on the same point there the second way the procedure mix if you're looking at a space a missing tooth area and you only have one way to fix it and that patient doesn't want that way maybe it's a removable partial denture they don't want something that comes in and out of their mouth, and you're not capable of doing it. The bridge is not indicated in that area. Uh, it's not indicated, so you can't do a bridge, and you can't place implants, then you're useless to that patient in terms of fixing that space. By increasing your procedure mix and adding the ability to place an implant, or uh, and that's kind of a, an easy example, but now you've instantly made your, yourself, your practice grow and yourself more productive just by being able to offer either of those services. So those are the two ways that I that I would first check if you're wondering, you know, how do I grow my practice? Am I available to the extent that I could be or want to be? And two, are, are the procedures that I'm offering and able to diagnose reflective of what my schedule has available? Yeah, so, you know, I, I agree. We've definitely seen practices add more hours to the week and raise revenue. Just as a word of caution for people out there, We've also seen it where the employees don't like that ex those extra hours, so they don't move towards filling up those hours as actively. So if you're going to make that, make sure you have a, a strong, strong understanding of your leadership role in that practice. Um, because if you're not leading them correctly, that specific thing seems to be able to be fairly easily sabotaged <laughs> internally um yeah. so that and that if that occurs that is a leadership and employee issue um you know that shouldn't be the issue but yeah that's really good advice for people out there so um as far as you know the ability to do this you know i'm talking about leader back circling back to leadership and things like that um you know you know you mentioned earlier in the episode that the uh one of the benefits of having uh, being in a DSO is that there's a, that extra layer of taking it away from the dentist responsibilities to have to, you know, be the day-to-day, minute-by-minute leader, if you will, of the employees that are there every day. I'm not saying that the, the clinical practitioner isn't the leader of the practice, but there's diff there's different there's another level of that. Talk to me about you know what you feel about as far as the future of just dentistry in general, and that you know is. Is, is that going to become more of the norm, you think? Or do you feel like people are going to continue doing it the way that they have been? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Now, listen, there's a, there's a ton of factors that are contributing. So to, for me to be able to point to one and say this is what's wrong, uh, or, or maybe not even wrong, this is why it's happening, is, 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 not, is not possible. But the 
proliferation and the growth in the multi-site owners and the group practices in the really huge uh, dental service organizations that are that are private equity backed or whatnot, that growth is is not slowing down and it's not going to because of the the rigid factors and the amount of factors that are contributing to that. So, you know, I can just point to a few. I mean, student loan debt, uh, the number of graduating dentists, the the commodization, I don't know how to say that word, but making dentistry more of a commodity in the patient's mindsets, the patient's mindsets in terms of what they want and and, and expect from, from dentists and, and their attitudes toward them. All of those things um, are so insurance from the re- reimbursement level, supply costs and, and, and the the issues that are going on there, all of that stuff, the cost of technology that, that makes dentists better is pushing towards, like most industries, and, and you know, I understand that dentistry is a profession also, but as a whole, it is also representative of a healthcare industry, uh, is pushing towards consolidation of that industry. It happened in medicine, it happened, it's happening, or it happened in pharmacy, it's happening in veterinary, and it's happening in dentistry, and, and that's not going to change. Now, I don't think it's, uh, my personal opinion, I don't think it is a pharmacy situation where you're left with, I would say the majority, I, I don't know the exact statistics or something like that, of, but of prescriptions going to the Walmarts and the Walgreens and the CVSs of the world um, versus the mom and pop pharmacies. I think we're more I think we're more into a future like maybe big law firms have where there's there's the big dominating groups that handle, you know, the majority of stuff. And then there's a, a segment of more boutique, uh, individually ran law offices that support uh, more high profile clients or more clients that want a more uh, personalized approach. I think that's more of what it's going to look like. I mean, not even to the extent that medicine is where you you're really hard pressed to drive down the street and find an individually owned doctor or MD at this point. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily the future, but I think it's naive and, and borderline dangerous to think that it's not going to be more of a 50, 50 thing versus a, I think the last statistics that I heard were probably 20% of, of patients were being seen by a, a DSO managed dental office. Um, and, you know, I, even, even you may disagree uh, on this and, and that's fine, but I just think that it's not bad for dentistry. Now they're, they're bad actors, uh, but they're bad actor private dentists too, but it, it allows when done the right way, it allows cl- clinical work to be pushed to the forefront instead of being one of two hats that are being worn by the dentist. Um, it's better for patients, you know, assuming the quality, the clinical quality, because they do have a convenience factor. They do have a, a price, you know, dentistry is expensive. They do have options when it comes to price. They do have different, you know, elements to to that um, aspect. So I don't think it has to be bad. And in a lot of ways, I think it's good for, for dentistry, but uh, in any, any opinion, uh, it is inevitable that we'll be, more DSO based uh, in terms of patient seen and, and revenue provided by uh, than we are in 2018 and 2021 or 2022. Yeah. And, you know, I also see a lot of the things that you're talking about. Uh, another factor that you didn't mention was um, this has somewhat been encountered in the recent past just because of the fact that uh, entrepreneurship has been made uh, cool again. But um, if you talk about things like um, the amount of people that are getting out of school and becoming professionals and are renting their home rather than buying their home, that number is increasing to, on to the weight of people renting. And that is uh, something that's happening with, with a certain, the age groups right now that are the younger age groups. Um, it's more prevalent there, um, which is the type of attitude that is much more inclined to be worried about uh, work-life balance than to be worried about careers, if you will. So that lends itself to people potentially not wanting to be owners as much, which then creates the workforce for these DSOs to have people to be able to work for them. Um, I think that could be a contributing factor as well. 
Um, the, the one thing that not just the, not just the mindset, but also the demographic. I mean, I, you don't have to comment on this. Because, now, I don't want it to be too controversial, but I mean, it's look at the statistics on on female dentists in private practice versus female dentists in, in DSO back locations, mm-hmm. and then compare them to the male. Same for a male. Um, and I understand the males have kind of a it's going to be a little skewed because older males are going to be what the majority of dentists and they're going to have been private practice owners. But just in the recent years, um, females have historically shown uh, a more likelihood to be an associate versus an owner or, or being a DSO than a, than a private practice. So dentists or females are becoming the majority of graduating dentists. Also, as, as that demographic trend switches or, or to foreign trained dentists or to uh, different ethnicities that have shown to be more likely to lean towards associateship versus ownership, um, then obviously you have a natural uh, progression into DSOs versus private practice, just based on the demographics, right. irrespective right. of the, yeah, percentage-wise, yeah. irrespective of the of the factors that are contributing, even those who would want to be private practice owners, uh, forcing them, I guess, in a way to, to a, a DSO relationship, so. Uh, and then, of course, the mindset of millennials and, and the work-life balance and that kind of stuff is a factor as well. And one of the things that, you know, and, and you know, I, I agree with everything you've said so far. I, I see some different, definite value in the in that uh, trend. Uh, there's all, obviously with any value, there's all, obviously, a, um, you know, a, a counteract to that. And I think that one of those pieces is, you know, there is, for a long time, there has been a stigma around corporate dentistry. Uh, and the, the easiest one to pick on is, is, is uh are ones like Aspen Dental, uh, ones that, you know, if you go online, just like with any business that has multiple locations, um, you can find, you know, tons of bad reviews, you know, they're, they'll, they'll be in trouble with different state boards on, um, you know, re- recruitment issues or not recruitment issues, but, uh, um, you know, clinical items. And that's, you know, that's, that's going to be the doctor's fault, um, that that's doing that, maybe not the corporate side. But there's a possibility that the reason the stigma is there is because for a while, at least this is my reading of it, and this is not, uh, you know, other than the, you know, I'm not going to say that any of this is, um, you know, a hardcore definite, but certain corporate structures were set up to drive revenue, to drive production, rather than to drive clinical dentistry. And I think that's where that stigma got, was created. I don't think that stigma would be there if there wasn't some truth in it. Um, I completely agree. I've seen it firsthand. Like I'm not, I'm not naive to that at all. And, and I let me bring up two points in, in response to it. And one, you know, I, I've seen the Dental Town Post, and I, you know, being a young dentist, I haven't been out, you know, a long time enough to ha- hear all these horror stories. But you know, just recently, an associate who worked with us um, wanted to go to back home to a different area, uh, so he, he asked to to be let out of his contract with us a little bit early. So that he could participate with this this other DSO uh, more closely, so that he could get transferred back home um, as per their request, uh, met with us and, and a month or two after, uh, sorry, a year or so after starting with this company, and he he is a personal reference of ours into that kind of stuff that actually happened. He's a salaried paid employee who they walk in and they tell him, "You need to produce one hundred forty thousand dollars a month, or you're fired." Um, you're doing 75. This is our average production. Why are you? Why are you below? Well, I mean, there is not. And they're absolutely a bad actor within this space, and they're giving they're giving good quality clinician ran DSOs and groups a, a bad rap. And I understand that. And they're they're out there. They're bad actors out there. There's the Aspens of the world. There's the there's the this group. Uh, of the world who only care about the number on the spreadsheet, not the, the clinicians or the, the patients or the clinicians. But, you know, the only thing I can hope for there is that they get exposed and that that patient education does overrule that eventually and that people will wise up to that. And, you know, I, I'd like to think they will. Uh, I can't guarantee it, but uh, I just feel like if you continue to do poor quality and you continue to have that reputation, that eventually that'll go under. Um, and secondly, the second point I want to make to this, I also think it's bad for associates to be the long-term answer for a practice. I think on-site ownership, to some extent, is is what's necessary for for quality to to be where it's at, to be the dentist, the office to be ran appropriately. 
So, you know, in, in our group, for instance, the individual practices, they have ownership. The doctors, or, or they have ownership availability to them, I guess I should say. Not all of them have owners on site at this point, but, you know, something that we're, we are passionate about, of about getting, and there, I'm not saying we're unique in this aspect. A lot of groups are, are doing this, but uh, providing the on-site provider, the clinician, ownership in their practice um, we think is a win all the way around and I do think that'll be more of a trend than it has uh, in the past in the future. I do too and and that's kind of where I was going with it is, is it felt like it used to be that, that the stigma was what everyone thought and then a lot of money got thrown around with private equity deals and so people started trying to do like loosely held groups together and that didn't really work um, and then People tried to open up a bunch of offices, but they couldn't staff associate and they couldn't figure out how to run the business side of things. Some people did, but a lot of people failed at like, you know, present party included you, you did well with it, but a lot of people failed with it. Um, and, um, I feel like there's been over the past two years or so, I hear less and less of group practices. Now I hear more and more about good group practices, but I hear less of the, you know, I don't have any other term for it other than fly by nighters. Uh, people that were trying to do this and didn't end up doing it successfully. Um, and I feel like the reason a lot of those people missed the boat was that they didn't focus on aligning the goals of the practice with the goals of the associate. Um, and with models like yours, I think that that's a, that's a good marriage between the two in certain situations. Um, and I feel like the, pr- the people that have focused on that will do better. And I, I think that the reason that this wasn't done beforehand, again, this is just a wild assumptions on my part, is that the people who were, and there's obviously people that didn't follow that mo- model that did fine as well. Um, but um, I, I feel like the reason um, that a lot of people didn't offer the associates any type of ownership was because, I mean, we call spade a spade, in, in a way it was greed. Um, they didn't want to give any equity to the other people because whenever they sold, they wanted the whole, they wanted all the money, you know, because they were, and they were, they weren't wrong or right because of that. They weren't wrong because of the fact that it didn't work out, but they weren't, they weren't, or they weren't wrong in wanting to be able to receive some type of return on the amount of risk they took. Um, and they're not technically right for that either, but I feel like that was a misstep for a lot of people. And I feel like the model that you're talking about now is really the in between those two, in between the just one big corporate structure and in between the individually owned practice. Um, it, it allows an associate to be an indivi- you know an individual practice owner somewhat, as well as do the dentistry and focus on the dentistry. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's fair. I think that's what everybody's striving for. I mean, you don't want serial associates to come in and out and you have a constant doctor turnover and differences in clinical judgment and stuff that are, that are working on the same patient. That's, that's very, very tough. And it's probably not what's in the best interest of the patient. And certainly not what's in the best interest of the, of the business. Um, so, so trying to marry those sweet spots of, okay, what, what do you need to be happy uh, doc in terms of being here and, and coming to work every day and doing the very best for your patient without the, without us standing over your head, you know, talking that you need to produce 140 or we can't keep the place open, you know, where is that, where is that sweet spot? And I think it's a marriage of the, of the, the relationship based individual practice with an onsite don't owner who it matters to him, whether his business is successful or not, along with a entity that can represent him or her in the negotiations with the supply companies and the insurance companies, and they can give them stability in terms of income and, and stability in terms of, you know, if this location doesn't work out. We can, uh, we can either relocate or we can get you some hours somewhere else or, you know, that kind of thing. Or if you're going on vacation, we can have somebody cover your office, you know, that, that kind of, and, and take care of your emergencies, that kind of support, or if you're having a, a difficulty out of a lab and they won't respond, if we have a multiple provider sending cases there, then they're going to listen to us a little bit more, obviously, than mm-hmm. just you sending 10 grams a month there. So a marriage between those two, you know, thought philosophies is, is, is the sweet spot. And I think that's what everybody's striving for. And I think that is what's truly best for the industry in this consolidating 
you know, phase that we're in. And, you know, the, cl- the clinical part's easy to pick on because the the DSOs or the, the, the just organizations with a lot of doctor turnover and change, there's tons of different eyes on the same patient and the same work. Whereas a patient who's gone to the same dentist for 40 years, no one's ever looked at those teeth. So, you know, they could be they could be walking around with some really, really bad dental work. And, and unfortunately, I, I've seen it. Uh, and we've all done stuff that we're not proud of clinically. You know, there's just more eyes on it. So there's more people to see it, more people to judge it. So it's, it's easier to get that reputation, I guess, in my, in my opinion and based on what I've seen. Um, so, you know, so what's better, the, the on-site, the, the individual practice owner who has full ownership over that patient, his only eyes that are ever going to see him, and he's got, you know, his bills, and if his practice has a bad month, it negatively affects his family, and, you know, he's got to produce or else the office doesn't do anything, or an entity that has multiple eyes on the same patient to, to help judge quality. You know, what's what's better? I mean, it's if you get a good ethical dentist who really, really cares and tries hard to do their clinical best on every single patient, then, then yeah, probably the the on-site individual owner. But uh, unfortunately, that's that's not usually the case uh, in my experience. So, yeah. and then there's also always going to be those people that do want to be do their own thing. Also, um, you know, it's a uh, uh, the, the saying that I always I always give is that there, everybody has a different philosophies on on what they're they're best at i sometimes say that everybody has a, a, a different favorite flavor of ice cream one dentist that you know the setup of what you're talking about may not be for them they may not want to be a part of a, a group structure they might be a lone wolf you know so to speak um that they want they, they want to do it on their own so to me i think dentistry is a bit insulated comparatively to some of the other industries that you talked about um, pharmacy was a really easy one to like you said to pick on because i mean I actually have a friend who uh, works in pharmacy and he takes, he does his job from his home. <laughs> um, he doesn't even, so he doesn't even need an office and he does it for like hospitals in different States around the country. Um, so um, there, there's the medical side of things, which um, I, I believe a lot of what happened there was that um, a lot of patients wanted to be, you know, go to the doctor where everybody else was that needed to be there. Um, and then um, dentistry, I still feel is a very personalized element. And I, I do think that with um, the type of DSO that you've described, that you can give that personal element of it. Um, I will say from a business side, I'm very interested in seeing how, um, you know, you go from, you know, 12 to 13 to 25 to 50 to 100 locations, how that can continue to be offered. Um, because as scale goes up, a lot of the times what ends up being removed is the, the personal element. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see that, that happen. Um, I, I know that that's what you're committed to. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in seeing it occur uh, in, in, in the practices. So uh, I appreciate you coming on today. Um, if anybody has any other questions, uh, I know we actually talked before and you're like, yeah, we, I get people saying, you know, hey, how is it getting five, getting to five practices and things like that? So I said, hey, we're going to do an update call. Um, you know, what's a way for people to be able to get in, in contact with you? I know you help people out with some some elements of, of, of buying practices, friendly, you know, discussions about um, if, you know, something seems like a good idea or a bad idea. I know you've never been one to back away from giving your opinion on things. <laughs> um, so what, you know, is that something that you, you, you still like to do? Is that something that you like to say, hey, tag me in a Facebook group or, hey, have, you know, send me a, a notice on Dental Town and I'll respond to the post or something like that? Or how, how does that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely still like to be involved and, and give opinion and help show a different perspective about where we come from. So uh, I unfortunately, in a lot of ways, don't have as much time as I used to to answer emails and to, and to participate on Dental Town and on Facebook groups. But I, I still do it when I can. Um, I'm glad to answer any I just don't want to be, uh, I don't want people to rely on me to be, you know, the one, the, the, the source of information for them. So I'm a lot better nowadays about giving referrals to, to you know, to, to, to guys like yourself and attorneys and, and uh, practice transitioners and evaluators that I know and trust. Um, so I'm a lot more able to do that now than I was in the past versus me doing it all. Um, but 
uh, yeah, shoot me an email, hsmith at uh, gpsdds.com. Uh, tag me in a Facebook post. I mean, I'm Hunter Smith on there. Uh, I, I'm in a lot of the groups. Dentaltown, I, I still participate in. I don't answer private messages on there as much as I used to, but I still get a, a bunch of them, and I, I try to get to them. So uh, I'm a lot better, you know, just full disclosure about individual questions or uh, than a uh, – you know, do you have any input? You know, it's it's kind of hard when someone asks, "Do you have any input about me buying this practice?" Well, yeah, I have a whole whole bunch. Uh, but you know, if you ask me, "What do you think about the you know the the staff percentage here versus you know where the practice could be, or or is this out of line, or blah blah blah?" Then I'm a lot more able to answer those type of questions, and I love to do it. So uh, please, H Smith at gbsdds.com, and I will promise to try to do my very very best to get back to any listeners that that want to reach out to me very cool well we appreciate you being a friend of the podcast uh and everybody reach out to dr hunter say thank you for for coming on the podcast and sharing so much insider information from the owner of a uh, a growing and uh you know successful dso so dr hunter again thanks so much thanks jb So that's it for today's episode, but that doesn't mean that the learning and implementation have to stop there. I've created a free report called the 15 numbers that will make or break your dental practice. This report has been downloaded over a thousand times by dental professionals. So if you want your free copy of this report, that's going to outline what the most important numbers are in any dental practice. And it also includes how to look at your numbers, how to set goals, has a whole slew of really important information that is the culmination of all of my experience as a dental dental CPA. Then just go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. That is startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. And so that's it for today, Ambitious Dentist. Again, I'm Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV. I'll see you next week with another world-class practice owner or consultant that will help you start your very own dental practice.